Handouts? Yes, there we go. Matthew chapter 9. But he has a wonderful name. Above every name, he's a great shepherd. Stainer's a provider. And he is the authority of the kingdom. And that is what we've been looking at in this section, the authority of the kingdom. And I know we are making our way through these three chapters very quickly, as we're already in the middle of this section. And uh, and many places we could stop and we could reflect upon. I mean, within each of these miracles that Matthew shares in his gospel record are many applications to our lives of who Christ is and what he does for us and what he can do in us and what he does in people's lives. I mean, you can stop, you focus on the leper. You can focus on the centurion, uh, Peter's mother-in-law. The section where he reveals about Isaiah of how this is a proof of his prophecy that he was going to come. You can stop and speak many times in that first dialogue and then the, the, the calming of the sea. And I'm sure we've heard of many different messages from all these different miracles and applied in many different ways. And we could stop and we could focus on those. But Matthew, at this present junction of his gospel record, as we go through it section by section, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, uh, discourse by discourse, ministry by ministry, Matthew's focus at this present junction of this gospel record is to declare the authority of the kingdom. Jesus is the king of the kingdom of heaven. You know, you go back to Matthew chapter 1. Jesus is king by right. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He is king by right. Chapter 3, he is king by character. Matthew chapter 3, verse 15. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him at his baptism. Of course, then you go into the testimony in Matthew chapter 4 of him in the wilderness and how though Satan, he was tempted directly by Satan. Three different ways in three different areas. He stood firm and righteous. He is king by character. Jesus is king by wisdom as we explored the principles of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And now through this series of miracles that we've been going through, we can see that Jesus is king by deed. Matthew chapter 8, verse 27. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? In the authorized version, it says, What manner of man is this? The winds and seas obey him. He is king by deed. And as Matthew works his way through this narrative, he groups the various miracles in a certain way. They're not in a chronological order like Mark has recorded them, but they're in an instructional order. It's as if Matthew is following an outline and taking the different elements of Jesus' ministry to prove who Jesus is, that he is the authority of the kingdom. Then as you go through this narrative, we come, in, we come along these various dialogues. And he, they sit in between these various groups. And they provide a bridge to the next group of miracles. But they also show us a call to a decision or decisions that are being made by individuals who are come in contact with Jesus and have experienced Jesus' ministry and had observed Jesus' ministry. We've already discussed the first dialogue. It came at the end of that set of miracles that were performed for the leper and the centurion and Peter's mother-in-law. And it reinforced that call to acknowledge the authority by our commitment. And will we commit ourselves to trust the king with the dream? 
The scribe comes in. What does Jesus say to him? Matthew chapter 8, verse 20. Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Would that scribe trust the king with the dream? Then are we willing to align our earthly commitments, work, family, all those, under the commitment to the king? Matthew chapter 8, verse 21, 22, excuse me. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Are you willing to align your earthly commitments under the commitment to the king? Are you willing to trust him? With those commitments? And today we come to the second dialogue, and beginning with his own testimony, Matthew shows that the authority of the kingdom is confirmed by decision. The authority of the kingdom is confirmed by decision. And I know some of you have seen this already. But there's a series called The Chosen. And in episode 7, they capture what is happening in this passage beautifully. And so I want to share that with you. So here's a scene from the production on their YouTube channel. We live in the same world, Matthew. Next. Besides, what else are you going to do with a mind like yours? Matthew. Matthew, son of Alpheus. Yes. Follow me. Me? <laughs> yes, you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. What are you doing? You want me to join you? Keep moving, street preacher. Do you have any idea what this guy has done? Do you even know him? Yes. Listen, I said to you. What are you doing? Where do you think you're going? Guys, let me go. Have you lost your mind? You have money. Quintus protects you. No Jew lives as good as you. You're gonna throw it all away. Yes. I don't get it. You didn't get it when I chose you either. But this is different. I'm not a tax collector. Get used to different. I'm glad we passed by your booth today, Matthew. Yes. Shall we? We have a celebration to prepare for. You will regret this, Matthew. What's the tablet for? I grabbed it without thinking. You can put it back. No, no, keep it. You may yet find use for it. Where are we going? A dinner party. I'm not welcome at dinner parties. Well, that's not going to be a problem tonight. You're the host. Hey, it's Dallas and the creator of The Chosen. Well, and yes, season one of The Chosen is complete. All eight episodes, they're available right now. You can look up The Chosen in the App Store or Google Play and we're easy to find. You can download it and be watching within minutes. And in fact, it's unprecedented technology. You can connect to almost any device you have directly and you don't- A little advert at the end of the video. So I hope you check so out you know season we can find one it. chosen right now. It is free. So feel free to grab it and watch it. I know some of you have already done that. But anyways, it captured what is going on here beautifully. Absolutely beautifully. But by their decisions, 
these individuals that we're going to look at today, Matthew being one of them, confirm to those around them who Jesus was. So let's get into this narrative. And we begin by seeing how the authority of the kingdom was confirmed by Matthew's decision to follow. We saw that just played out before us. The, decision, the authority of the kingdom was confirmed by Matthew's decision to follow. Verse 9, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he rose and followed him. Now, the term tax collector always puts a bad taste in our mouth. We hear the word, the phrase ATO, and we run. But in the first century Jewish culture, it was even worse. Tax collectors were the rubbish of Hebrew society, especially Jewish ones. They were considered traitors to their country. To choose the occupation of being a tax collector meant being exiled from the synagogue and unofficially from society. As I'm assuming that was Peter that was talking to Jesus. No matter how fair people knew you were, in other words, you weren't necessarily a thief, you would still be labeled as an extortionist and thug. To Jewish society, you were a legalized criminal. Yet we cannot feel too bad for Matthew. This was an occupation he chose. To the Jewish society, and the Jewish society wasn't necessarily wrong in their views of tax collectors. I mean, to be, to be a tax collector meant that you were a servant of Rome. You were a servant of a fo the foreign oppressors. And a tax collector... And, and it was, a tax collecting was a legalized form of extortion. I mean, a tax collector was really allowed to charge whatever they wanted to a certain extent so long as Caesar got his cut. And Matthew was willing to throw all, away his reputation within his community to give up synagogue life for that lucrative paycheck. Money ruled supreme in his life. It was his authority. Psalm 52, verse 7. Here is the man who did not make God his strength, but trusted in his abundance of riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. Proverbs 18, and verse 11. The rich man's wealth is his strong city, and like a high wall in his own esteem. Yet Matthew must have known that something was missing. The God he worshipped was not capable to fill that gaping hole that was in his life that longed to be filled. What does Jesus tell the Samaritan woman? John chapter 4, verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. If you were to ask any of the richest people in the world if money brought completeness to their lives, I don't think it would surprise me if they look at you and say no. I mean, they would say, yes, I, I, I enjoy nice things that he provides, a nice car, a nice house. I enjoy those things, but it has not made me complete. But it's Proverbs 25, will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle toward heaven. You no, know, for years he was one of the richest men. He was the richest man in the world, except for these past few years, when he's surpassed by Jeff Bezos, Amazon's founder and CEO. But in 2008, Bill Gates retired as the CEO of Microsoft. And since then, he has been pouring his life and money full time into improving the health and wellness of poor countries around the world through that foundation he and his wife started, the Gates Foundation. And he shared in a recent documentary that you can find on Netflix called Inside Bill's Brain that if you were to have asked him in his 20s if he would retire early, he would look at you and say you are crazy. 
building his business, designing software was his passion. That was his pursuit in his life. That is what governed his life. Yet as he reached his 40s, things began to change. The more he invested in his foundation, the more he saw a life outside of software. His once passion was not enough. He knew there were more fulfilling things to do. And I think this is what Matthew was going through his head as Jesus passed by that day. There's got to be something more than this. And as Jesus passed by and he called out, follow me. Matthew was provided the opportunity to change his pursuits, to change his authority. Matthew chose Jesus over the God of money. Religion and community were not authoritative enough to sway Matthew out of this, out of this, 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 this position. It could not pull him out of that authority, that, that, the grip that money and these resources had over him. I mean, they despised him. They thought he was a cheat. They thought he was a traitor. If Israel got freedom from Rome, it wouldn't surprise me if they charged Matthew with war crimes. That type of chastisement and condemnation was not enough to pull Matthew out of such a position and to give up that God of money. But Jesus passes by. He says, Matthew, son of Alphaeus, and Levi, son of Alphaeus, follow me. By his decision to leave the tax office, Matthew confirmed the kingdom authority. It was Jesus. Following him was worth leaving the riches behind. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. But what things were gained to me, Paul writes, these I counted, I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ. Now Matthew was excited for following Jesus was the best decision he had ever made. By following Jesus, the void that never could be filled was now full. But Jesus tells the Samaritan woman again after saying, you drink of that water, you're going to thirst. What does he say? John 4, verse 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Matthew found the fountain of living water. Jesus was powerful enough to fill that empty soul. So out of excitement, Matthew throws this grand party in honor of his new master, this new authority in his life. If you look at the beginning of Luke chapter 5, verse 29, the first phrase, it says, Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. So Matthew throws this grand party, and it's at this party that we see how the authority of the kingdom was not only confirmed by Matthew's decision to follow, but also I believe it was confirmed by the tax collectors and sinners' decision to come and eat. Confirmed by the tax collectors and sinners' decision to come and eat. Verse 10. You have your copies of God's word before you. Matthew chapter 9, verse 10. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. You know, we've already described tax collectors and who they were, but who were these sinners? Who are they describing when they use the term sinners? You know, sinners, that word translated as sinners, is an adjective that's sometimes used as a noun. We know sin is that aspect of missing the mark. Well, a sinner is describing someone who has missed that mark. 
That's the person who's missed that mark on a particular standard. And so these individuals, you could say, were the black sheep of society. They were not known for their strict adherence to the moral law of God, and they did not follow the code of the Pharisees. And like the tax collectors, they were cast out of synagogue life, and they were despised by the community. And now there's precedence to say that these were victims of a legalistic society. I get that. You know, they were treated harshly for being different and not normal. They were snubbed by society because they did not live socially acceptable lives. So as it made their situation worse. And I also don't want to diminish those of our day and age who find themselves lured into a life of debauchery by predators. We should fight for them. We should do whatever we can to help them break free from their abusers. Yet as I look at the context, and I see this group listed next to tax collectors who chose that profession, who chose legalized extortion, it would seem to me that these sinners were primarily people who actually freely chose this way of life. Like Matthew, the tax collectors worshipped the God of money. Sinners worshipped the God of lust. They chose deceitful and morally repugnant professions, thinking that these would fill the void of their life. Lust and money were the authorities that governed their lives. But like Matthew, they knew something was missing. The more they feasted upon the pleasures of this world, the more hungry they became. Their gods just would not be satisfied. They craved more and more and more, and it was destroying them. What does James write? James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away of his own desires and enticed. Then when desires are conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. It was eating away at their lives. And addictions do that. Addictions eat away little bit by little bit. Lust feasts and feasts and feasts and is never satisfied. And so when they heard Matthew was throwing a party for Jesus, this one they knew who had just left everything to go follow him, they decided to come and eat. They knew they were sick. And so they came to the great physician. And from Mark's record, we see that they followed Jesus. Mark chapter 2, verse 15. Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house, Levi is Matthew, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. You know, the traditions of the Pharisees were absolutely of no help to the human soul. These people lived among them. They had been they had been been cast out of synagogue life. The community avoided them at all costs because how dare anybody go near them? And this, this segregation was supposed, to, was supposed to convict them enough to come back and confess and make their sins right, but it only drove them further and further away. The traditions of the Pharisees were of absolutely no help to healing their condition. And so all these spiritual sick individuals found that in tradition was condemnation. As can be seen by how the Pharisees accused Jesus when they saw what was happening and what was going on around Jesus and his disciples at Matthew's home. Look at verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw it, they passed, I, don't, I guess they were passing by or were looking. 
looking in or observing and just trying to follow Jesus or try and find something. And all these tax collectors and sinners came and sat down and began to eat. And they're talking and they're fellowshipping and they're enjoying a meal together. And they saw this and all that they could throw at Jesus was an accusation. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? This is what these people found in their daily lives. They did not find help for their soul. They found condemnation. And it was of absolutely no help to them. The scribes and Pharisees were more concerned with appearance than the condition of the soul. You know, I think if the, the Pharisees and tax collectors could hide what they did and cover it up and make themselves look good, I don't think the Pharisees would really care. Because by their self-righteous condemnation, looked at them and said, I'm not like them. I'm cleaned up on the outside. By their self-righteous condemnation, tax collect the, 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 the Pharisees were condemning themselves, as Jesus so clearly points out. Matthew chapter 9, verses 12 and 13. When Jesus heard that, when Jesus heard the accusation to the, these tax collectors and sinners eating, and Jesus not getting up and leaving, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. So those who know that they're sick know they need a physician, and so they come and eat. But if you don't realize you're sick, you don't think you need a physician. Two opposing poles. The tax collectors and sinners, though despised by, by the society, knew they were sick and needed help. They were not finding it in the scribes and Pharisees' traditions. but they knew they could find it in Jesus, the great physician. And so they came and ate. And Jesus did what he has come to do. The scribes and Pharisees, on the other hand, did not realize they were sick. You could say they were asymptomatic, spiritually speaking. So he tells them, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I do not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus' words recorded in verse 13 were drawn from the prophet Hosea. Hosea 6, verse 6. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. And the expositor's Bible commentary points it out so beautifully that Hosea's quotation was not simply telling the Pharisees that they should be more sympathetic to outcasts and less concerned about ceremonial purity, but that they were being aligned with the apostates of Israel, of ancient Israel, and that they too were perverting the shell by losing the heart of the matter. What does God tell them in the Old Testament is the heart of the matter? Matthew, Mark, Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? The scribes and Pharisees were not doing that. And so these tax collectors and sinners just were being pushed further and further away from God. Instead of finding healing for their soul from the tradition of the Pharisees. But... When Jesus came, they came, sat and ate, and met the great physician who healed their souls. The decision by the tax collectors and sinners to come and eat with Jesus confirmed his authority. They were a witness to the self-righteous Pharisees that tradition and outward practice were not the authority that could heal the human soul. Jesus, the great physician, was that authority. 
Luke chapter 4, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recover of, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. The Pharisees were blinded to righteousness. They were asymptomatic spiritually. And when they saw the various other sores of their sin and of their, their, their disease, they said, oh, I'm okay. But they're sick and dirty. And for some odd reason, they thought, if I avoid them, maybe that will help heal them. Bring them this way. And her and the tax collectors and sinners saw them, and it just pushed them further and further away. They found no help. They found no relief from that. Jesus' ministry began to grow, and they saw the work that it did in Matthew's life. They case, And they said, oh, there's a meal. I can come meet this man, and he can heal me from my sickness. And they came. They knew they were sick and needed a physician. Whereas the Pharisees did not know. Therefore, they did not come. But as we go through this narrative, we find that there's quite the smorgasbord of people. Group, masses of different people that were either at or around this party. And we know Matthew was there because this was his house. We know Jesus, the tax collectors and the sinners there because they came and ate with Jesus and the disciples. Of course, this tells us that Jesus was there, but also that Peter, Andrew, James, and John were there. And the Pharisees were around because they accused Jesus of breaking their traditions. But we come to verse 14, and we find that the disciples of John were also present. I'm not sure if they were at this celebration or if they were just passing by or what was going on. But if you look at verse 14, it says, Then the disciples of John came to him. But they did not come to eat. And I don't think that they came to necessarily accuse Jesus or his disciples of anything. I believe they came out of a genuine desire to learn and get an answer to this nagging question about religious aesthetics. And so let's look at verse 14 again. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Why do we follow this religious practice, but your disciples don't? And it is in Jesus' response that we learn that the authority of the kingdom, of course, was confirmed by Matthew and his choice to follow. It was confirmed by the tax collectors and sinners who came and ate. But we learn now that it was confirmed by the disciples' decision to celebrate. And Jesus' answer was messianic in nature. It communicated to the disciples of John who Jesus was and what he was bringing with him. By their decision to celebrate, the disciples confirmed that Jesus was the bridegroom. Verse 15, and Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. You know, this instruction would resonate with the disciples of John. Because as Jesus' ministry grew, people came to John and asked him if he was concerned about Jesus' growing popularity. So we go to John chapter 3, verse 26. And they came to John and said, Rabbi, he who was with you in the, you know, beyond the Jordan, that one that you baptized, whom you said, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. So I said, are you concerned about this? Are you concerned about his popularity and people going and listening to him and whether he's going to contradict what you're saying or not? But John the Baptist responds without hesitation. 
verses 28 and 29 of John chapter 3. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ. I am not the Messiah. But I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. We call Jesus the bridegroom. And if you were to go into Old Testament prophecy and various other things and look at the culture of, of the Jewish uh, religious teachings, they often refer to the coming of Messiah as a wedding. And if you were to look at the the wedding ceremony of Jewish of that, uh, that first century Jewish way of life, it would actually communicate that work of the Messiah coming to collect Israel. It's a beautiful picture of that work. The bridegroom went and it would be preparing a house for his family to live in. And when that was finished, you never know when it was going to happen. But as soon as that was finished, he would come and he would call his bride and take him back to their house. And they would have the celebration. Beautiful picture of the coming Messiah. So this was what was in the mind of the first century Jews. That this is what the Messiah would be. This is who the Messiah would be. So this is what John is referring to. I'm the friend of the bride, he, bridegroom, he says. And I hear the bridegroom's voice and I rejoice. I celebrate. And so Jesus' disciples were simply following the testimony of John. Now was a time of celebration for the bridegroom had arrived. And was getting things in order to call his bride. So did, the, did the John's disciples, when Jesus said, this time to celebrate because the bridegroom has arrived, that put into mind, oh, Messiah is here. But also did the disciples' decision to celebrate confirm that Jesus was the authority that would usher in the new way. It is the authority that is ushering in the new way, beginning of verse 16. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. For that patch pulls apart and from the garment and tear, tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins. Or else the wineskins break the wine and is spilled. And the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. You know, John the Baptist, these are disciples of John, so this is where they're coming from, coming from John's teaching. And they, John is kind of their authority and instruction and are trying to follow his example. So John the Baptist was the minister or the messenger of transition. John chapter 1, verse 23. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet of Isaiah said. He says, I'm the one preparing the way. I am a transition person to the one greater who's coming, whose shoes I am unworthy to latch because he was before me. John the Baptist was the last of the great prophets through whom the Spirit of Christ testified of the coming grace and the glory that would follow. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who is in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that would follow. John was the last of these great prophets that predated Christ. He was the messenger of transition. By their decision... Jesus' disciples confirmed to the disciples of John who Jesus was. The one to bring in that new way. The old way and means were finishing their course and would not, could not be mixed with the new and living way, the way of the kingdom of which Jesus is king. You know, John the Baptist said it so plainly. John chapter 3, verse 3. You know, he says, I'm not the Christ. And he tells him, I'm listening and I hear the bridegroom's voice and I rejoice. And in that same context, he says this, he must increase, but I must decrease. 
John knew his ministry was coming to an end. For the one who would bring in that new way, that way where the law would be written upon our hearts, is coming as a Messiah, as a bridegroom king. And the disciples' decision to celebrate confirmed to the disciples of John who Jesus was. That bridegroom you've been looking for, he's here. That one to bring in the de- that way where he would thresh the wheat and separate the chaff and write the law upon your hearts, he's here. So that old ways and means are finishing their course now, making way for the new way, the way of the kingdom of which Jesus is king. The decision of Matthew to follow, the decision of the tax collectors and sinners to come and eat, the decision of Jesus' disciples to celebrate, confirmed who Jesus was. He was not just another Bible teacher, some street preacher, some other prophet just coming along the way. He was so much more. Jesus is the teacher worth following. Jesus is the physician worth seeing. Jesus is the king worth celebrating. So what will your decision be? The first dialogue challenges us to acknowledge the authority by commitment. Will we trust him with the dream? Or is our dream our God? Will we trust him to align all of our earthly commitments under our commitment to him? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Will we trust him? To sort those issues out. Trust him with family. Trust him with work. Trust him here. Trust him there. What will your decision be? Will you follow him? Luke chapter 9 verse 23. Then he said to to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Will you be like Matthew? And follow him. Will you come to him? Matthew 11 verse 28. Come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Will you be like the tax collectors and sinners who came? Will you celebrate him? Ephesians chapter 5 verses 19 and 20. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The bridegroom has come. He has brought in a new way. Now is the time to celebrate. For our our bridegroom is making things ready and will come one day to call us home to him. What will your decision be? Will you confirm the authority of the kingdom by your decision? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day and thy word. We rejoice in your goodness and grace to us. We thank you for the testimony of Matthew the testimony of tax collectors and sinners, the testimony of the disciples. And it's sad to see, but we thank you for the warning found in the indecisiveness and the wrong decision of the Pharisees who just would not let go of their self-righteousness. Lord, as we go out from this place to a world around us, may the world see our decision. May the world see our decision to follow you. May they see our decision to come and eat with you. May they see our decision to celebrate you. Father, we love you. 
We praise you. We look forward to seeing what you're going to do in Christ's name. Amen. Got a couple notices as we finish, but does anybody else have anything they'd like to add or share?